uh, why are you bringing a pediatrician in this whole deal? And then I realized uh, they're, they're getting even with me. And I'll tell you a personal uh, clinical story that I had when I first started practice over 30 years ago. Uh, I work at the Baker Clinic downtown and uh, Dan Hasanoff, uh, one of the other pediatricians in my office, at that time there was a lot of breastfed uh, jaundice uh, around and I said, you know, why don't we just check these kids phenotype for alpha one trips? So I was a hot shot young guy, I said, we'll, uh, we'll just see what happens and uh, we did about seven cases. We just said between us, we'll just, the next seven kids that come in with breastfed jaundice, we'll do their pie type and all of them were MZs. We, we never published it. We, we often wondered if we should have, but I'll tell you, when you see what happens later on with the concerns about confidentiality and labeling people, these are huge issues uh, for people, for insurance. Uh, and we've seen that in other diseases already in pediatrics. We make these diagnoses early before there's any real problems, and we create a tremendous amount of work for us as doctors trying to explain to people and then, okay, who else are we going to test? And some people don't want to know. Uh, sometimes the father isn't the father. Uh, we have all those sort of issues. Um, so when he asked us to talk, I, I, or asked me to talk, I said, I'm not sure what I can tell you. I can tell you I probably have more patients that I know of that have alpha-1 antitrypsin issues uh, than other people. And we definitely have been following this over the years. Um, I thought it was interesting when I was reading uh, this brochure that was given out to you about uh, uh, the incidence of CF versus uh, cystic fibrosis versus alpha-1 antitrypsin. And uh, we just had a meeting yesterday with uh, Dr. Mark Montgomery from Calgary who sort of runs, uh, he was the one that brought screening into Alberta. And actually our Alberta numbers are 1 in 3,850. So you're very close to the same incidence uh, in this province. And again, uh, as uh, Dr. Cave said, uh, the, there are ethnicity issues. Um, and so the genetics become quite complicated. And I thought it was interesting how all of these recommendations for us as pediatricians, we'd never screen anybody, right? I mean, if you look at these recommendations, there's no reason to do it, but I think because I'm a pediatrician, I think parents should know. And when a kid's 18, he should know, or she should know, that she might be carrying one of these genes. Because I think it makes huge, huge decisions for them. Because we now see it with uh, the cystic fibrosis screening, which is done in Alberta, and all across Canada except Quebec, uh, as an issue. Um, the other thing that I have found very interesting when you look at these various genes and the phenotypes, the MZs, the SZs, the ZZs, um, our bodies have been organized very, very efficiently. You have to lose a tremendous amount of activity in an enzyme before you actually have trouble. Basically, in the cystic fibrosis world and in the alpha-1 antitrypsin world, you have to have about only 10 to 15 percent of your functionality of your, this enzyme, then you have trouble. If you have 50 percent, you're fine, we think. Uh, and that's probably where we lie to a lot of people. Uh, in that if you are an MZ, I'm sure you don't have perfectly normal lungs. We'll find that out over time. Um, the, the smoking histories in our practices, and I'm sure Dr. Cave can, uh, as a family doc, when 20 years ago, two packs a day was a common number. As we've raised the price of cigarettes up, it's come down, down, down. We're, the average smoker in my practice, you know, the parents, half a pack a day. I mean, uh, that's about it. That's what they smoke. Uh, so, you know, with all these screening things, you're never going to get to 20 pack years anymore. Um, so uh, again, I'm, I'm a little nervous about these, these who we should be screening. Um, I got interested in it because I do take care of a lot of kids with asthma. And some of these asthmatics don't behave like asthmatics. They, they end up getting 
way too many markings on their chest x-ray uh, and they end up getting little pneumonias and things. And when we finally discover that they do actually have uh, one of these deficiencies in the alpha-1, we go back to basic pediatric lung clearance techniques uh, to help them. And we treat them more aggressively. Now, in this country, if you give a kid antibiotics nowadays, you're considered evil. Uh, you know, we've had that crazy lady on TV going on, bugs don't need drugs. If you have alpha-1 antitrypsin problem in your lung and you're not an antibiotics, wrong. Now, the antibiotic that we all love in our game is uh, something called biaxin, clarithromycin is the uh, generic name. Um, our great government, if you think you've got problems with this screening, you wait till you get what happens next January when a new drug plan comes in, uh, which was totally glossed over by everybody in the budget. Um, he's talk they're talking about BC Pharmacare. They've told people they'll give them 18% of the generic drug value. Uh, clarithromycin, which is now genericized in this country, uh, the government said we'll give you 18% of uh, retail price. They said, guess what? We're not selling it to you. They we're going to see more of that happen, I think. So Biaxin is the drug that we've really enjoyed having for our patients because it actually also has an anti-inflammatory effect. So all of you in this room know that alpha-1 antitrypsin is there to neutralize the, the uh, neutrophil elastase uh, that you're having whenever your neutrophils, your white cells, are out there busy doing their, their job. And in your body you have always these plus minus uh, uh, things that work all through your body. So I think um, with these, these antibiotics, uh, they've been very good at helping us get rid of this. And the, the Biaxin has been a wonderful drug. So I'll even give prescriptions to patients. When your kid's sick, start it. The other thing that we use a lot of is uh, other techniques to get rid of uh, the things in your lung, which the other famous drug that we like is Venlin, Salbutamol. Um, Everybody thinks it's an asthma drug. It's a great drug for anybody that coughs. It does something else that everybody forgets about. It doesn't just dilate your airway. It also makes the little cilia, which are the hair cells in your lung, move better. And I can get it up and out of your lungs better with Venlin. And you ask anybody, even the mothers love it when they're giving their kid Venlin. They're sniffing the, the extra just so they feel better. <laughs> The other thing that um, I think we're going to see a lot of in, in this disease and other diseases that are genetic, there is a whole bunch of modifier genes, what we call modifier genes. So if you have this gene and you have this gene, you get this. And what I've never understood, uh, you know, Dr. Yap with his uh, kids that have renal fa or kid uh, liver failure from ZZ, and these, the rest of everybody is fine. Their lungs are perfect. Like, how's that all happen? Uh, and then for us, when we do all these lung function tests, which by the time you look like you got COPD, and Dr. Cave and I could have a little argument, what is the difference between COPD and bad asthma? I'm not sure we could actually answer that easily. Um, there, there's going to be issues uh, with that. Um, the prolastin, I followed that because I thought this is going to be great. We're going to be able to give these kids prolastin, stop everything, right? Well, guess what? It doesn't happen. We, we can't figure out how to use it. Uh, I've watched in the cystic fibrosis trials. I thought it would fail because it's so complicated. It's not that simple. And the other sort of areas of research that we've been involved in is how to deliver drugs to the lung where the action should be. And I would think over the next few years, there's going to be some major breakthroughs in that. And maybe we'll be able to do much better with the delivery of these drugs. Unfortunately, we'll be stuck with, you know, Health Canada approvals, which uh, you guys deal with every day, which, which are a problem for us. And to try to use something off-label is very, very difficult. Um, I 
The only other thing that I would say in pediatrics that we have watched uh, is uh, the lung function tests are totally useless to us as to trying to pick this stuff up. We do use them more uh, in pediatrics probably than adults because we have very good uh, quick lung function machines in all of our, uh, with the new computer technology, we can do a lung function on you in, in two minutes and, and tell you what's going on. Um, we don't have to do the big full uh, body, body box thing. Um, so I don't, like I said, I don't have a whole lot to tell you. And I thought this was going to be more of a town hall meeting and wanted to hear the questions that you had and maybe uh, go from there. So I wanted to do it short. He said I didn't have to talk a lot. <laughs> so I'll leave it there and open it up for general uh, discussion.